Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, so our topic today is reducing IOPS in VDI, um, basically how to build predictable desktops. How many people are struggling with IOP-related issues, application slowdowns, and so forth? So it's a topic that hopefully you'll get some information on. Um, and I also want to teach you how to measure these IOPS um, and give you a little bit of an update on where I think storage is going and um, some of the new players in the market. So basically, the you know, first slide is why, why is an IOP important? Well, one of the reasons IOP is important is the measure of input-output operations per second. And unfortunately, we use this as a benchmark for storage. So just like we typically use CPU percent for the CPU, this is the benchmark that we would measure for how fast um, I.O. is going for storage. Um, we'll talk today about two basic patterns. Um, basically, generally you'll hear I.O. talked about a read or write. You're either writing something to the disk, you're reading something from the disk, and that read is either sequential, meaning in order, or it's random, which means in, um, obviously in a random order. We're going to cover reducing IOPS in VDI. We're not going to go into a true deep dive of IOPS. We just do not have time in this presentation. And we're really not going to go have time to talk about SAM optimization in this session. So it'll be important as the session progresses that we kind of keep a scope for what we're going to talk about. I need to tell you about some tenants that you need to know about before you start this presentation. And the first one that you need to go into this presentation is that nothing, you know, the old thing is nothing um, in life is free. So IOP time could come at the expense of something else, whether it's money, whether it's um, increased CPU, um, it will come at a price. The best way to save 100 pounds is to find 1,600 ways to save an ounce. If you've been to my decreasing login time, this is the same thing I've told you. So it's important, but some of these things may seem minor. But the problem is, is when you start firing up hundreds of desktops or thousands of desktops, that tiny little problem or 30 tiny little problems become a big problem. So some of these things we'll talk about today, you may say, ah, ah, why do you care? Well, you do because they can become um, a big problem. Always know that Windows wants it all. So Windows wants to consume, obviously, just like we all do, we want to get in the car and drive as fast as possible. Windows wants to consume as much I.O. as possible and the amount of time that it can consume as possible. Reducing IOPS will not always result in a loss of user functionality. So your, your job, hopefully, as an admin, when you do some of these tweaks, um, the user may not even know, but will have huge um, benefits on the back end. IOPS are always IOPS. Redirecting them is not shifting them. So a lot of people will talk about, um, let's redirect application data, or let's redirect a folder. And that'll solve my VDI IOP problem. Well, no, you just redirected that problem somewhere else. Um, let's, let's, um, some people make the argument that PVS reduces IOPS because it helps with boot storms. Well, yes and no, because most people are caching PVS on disk. So all you're doing is shifting those IOPS while most of those boot IOPS are coming from memory. All you're doing is writing them back to the disk somewhere else. So just always, when you start looking at this, we have to remember that when you redirect, you're basically shifting them. It is what it is. Um, in most cases, unless you have control over a SQL statement, the app is the app, and unless you work with a vendor, that's the way it is. Windows works the way it works. Um, things evolve, things change, that we are getting more um, cloud-centric, and we are trying to, the apps you see now, it's kind of funny because Microsoft, like with Office 365, they're running into the same issues that I've been talking about for years, and they're now making their products more cloud-like. But today, basically, in some cases, it is what it is. And always, when you're troubleshooting your IOPS and performance issues in your environment, focus on big picture. Don't let, um, let data drive you, um, not your emotions, because that can get you um, going down the wrong track really quickly. Eight, nine, and 10 is the most important message I want you to take back today, is that most of these IOPS we're going to talk about today is stuff we really don't care about. It's for when you start looking at VDI or you start looking at um, remote desktop or you start looking at hosting applications, there is a difference between application data, someone's, someone's user data that makes up their persona, that if we lost that information, we would need to recover it 
or we would take an outage for the company versus we're paging some stuff in memory, we're caching some information. Most of the IOPS you do on the desktop are not data IOPS, they're caching IOPS, and they're IOPS that if we lost them and the whole, whole enterprise went down, we could boot somewhere else and lose no data. So we're doing all of this IO and a lot of this IO patterns for stuff we don't really care about. So it's important when you work with your SAN vendors and you work with your various vendors is you design around that because a lot of times they spend all this money on all this data redundancy when that may not be needed for what you're trying to accomplish. So, quick little analogy here. We talked about before, most IOP patterns are read and, write, um, read and write and random or sequential. I think we all know that. Keep in mind that doing an IOP, if I walk and I do an IOP in memory and I do it that quickly, if I was doing that on disk, that's like walking the length of a football field. So you, and when I mean disk, I mean brown round disk. So you can, keep, you can imagine that when you have a large number of IOPS, you have to learn to deal with these IOPS effectively or you'll start um, running into a queuing issue. So we have to do the IOPS somewhere, um, and there's all different media types, but generally the ones that you're probably most familiar with in here are gonna be the, we'll talk about these basically three media types. And one is SATA, and SATA is probably, how many people know about SATA? It's typical in your desktop drives, it's IDE, it's basically a, um, it's a hard drive. It can get about 75 or 100, it is improving, there are some 10K drives. Um, but it was designed, that drive was really designed for sequential I.O. And it's not the best handler of random I.O. So when you're buying storage, and because you have to place these IOPs somewhere, um, basically what you're doing is building a, a racetrack to put these IOPs on so you can go, you'll need to pick some storage types. SAS, SCSI, um, can typically get about 175 to 200 IOP, 110 IOPs, random IOPs um, for your disk. And obviously SSD, based on the memory type. There's NOR and NAND based on a lot of factors we won't get into today for SSD. You can get 400 plus IOPs. You can calculate uh, IOPs of brown round with the formula here. So if you take the drive specs, because drives come in different specs, um, you can buy a desktop drive that is a really slow performer, or you can buy one that's a fast performer. Um, and if you take the seek latency divided by the relative latency and divide that by 1,000, that will get you how many IOPS you should expect on that drive. This chart I got from um, some of the links that I'll send you at the end of the presentation here. Did not generate this chart. But this typically shows you um, for an average steady state user, a power user of XP would use between 12 and 16 IOPS and 15 to 25 IOPS for the desktop powered on. Now obviously, um, if you, anybody use remote desktop in here, you have more users on the server, you're gonna generate IOPS. I have seen, and I will tell you, um, this number go up on a single server above 100 IOPS per second, which is quite a lot. And I'll explain to you why, and we'll talk about how to measure these things. It's important when you are planning any VDI implementation or you're planning any remote desktop implementation, it's important for you to do tests in your environment to determine what your IOP patterns are gonna be like. Because you can't buy storage and you can't allocate storage if you're not sizing properly. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, keep in mind that when you buy storage, you may not be buying just space. You're also buying performance, and that's a common misconception as well. Now, um, another little chart here um, that breaks it down a little bit further here. We talked a little bit about the disk speeds. We talked a little bit about RIOPS. Um, your RAID level can also affect, so on the back end of a SAND, or the back end of a physical, generally RAID array, um, or a disk array, you generally just don't have one drive. So what we wanna do, since the drive can only do so many IOPS, we have to scale that across um, either a SAND or a physical RAID array. And generally when we do that, we group these disks, and we group these disks, and we add some sort of redundancy to them, and we call that RAID. And obviously, depending on the type of um, RAID platform will also affect how many IOPS you can do per second. 
So it's important when you're planning and scaling IOPS, not only do you understand the sand and what your sand's capable of, but also what the backing sand and how the backing sand is rated. This is a pretty good chart, but you'll need to do your own numbers, and I'll teach you today how to do your own numbers. Um, when you boot a desktop, you will typically do 26 IOPS per second. So if you have, if you boot 500 desktops, you can take 500 times 26, and that's the load you'll need to have. Um, log in is about 14. You're working, we said before, about eight or 12, and idle about four. But it all depends. Can anybody tell me why this number could shoot through the roof? You could have a desktop that might be at idle. Let's say that goes to 25 IOPS at idle. You may have some software on there, I'm gonna teach you today, that's poorly written, that even at idle is doing IOPS. So it's important for you to know what your environment is doing, not what the white papers publish and tell you. Now, a couple of formulas from Citrix that you may want to get. Um, total raw IOPS equals the disk IOPS times number of disks. You can get the formula for functional IOPS there. And functional basically is a pretty good number to tell you what functionally you need. And then you can calculate your number of supported desktops from your functional desktops divided by your life cycle IOPS. So these are some formulas as you are um, going through your planning of your environment that you can figure out a, what kind of storage, how much storage um, based on performance, and how many desktops you can get. But again, you need to come up with these numbers yourself. You can use the baselines from your vendors, but I'd be careful about trusting them. So just for example, and these are not accurate numbers, but for example, suppose we have, if we took 150 SAS 15K drives, and we had 200 of them, our functional IOPS is let's say about 11,000, then we could calculate, we can almost get about 771 at login. Where if we added um, 200 disk at SAS 15K ray 10, our functional IOPS of 18,000, we should get about 1,300. So depending on, again, what ray level, what disk, what controllers, and there's another player that comes into this that everybody's starting to play with, there's one big player that also dramatically affects this as well. Does anybody know what that might be? Cash. There are various types of cash, and we'll talk about this today, and cash can dramatically affect these numbers as well based on the product and based on the caching algorithms it is. Typically, when you are looking at desktop patterns, so remember we talked about IOPS, we're going to be read IOPS and write IOPS, and when you're looking at desktop patterns, it's important for you to note that most of your desktops are going to be 80% writes, 20% reads. Why do you think that's important when you start talking about your storage platform? Writes go to disk. Reads can be written from, read from disk or read from cache, but it's much easier typically to buffer reads than it is writes. Writes are, um, depending on the storage, a um, little bit... Um, more intensive and a little bit more of a performance overhead. So when you have a lot of writes, it really ups the game that your storage needs to be um, on the ball. What you typically, what most storage vendors do is when you do a write, you're truly writing to RAM. A lot of people, it's kind of a misconception. Um, based on if you have a battery backup and a solid solution, your goal is to put most of those writes and, um, and put those, and what they'll do is they'll write to RAM, and then as they have time, they'll, they'll write, those writes will then go to disk. Well, the problem is if you have a lot of desktops and you haven't scaled out your SAN properly, you flood the cache with all of these writes, and then what happens? Then you start delaying on the desktops because the RAM cache is full, and now you're queuing to disk. So accurately doing your cache, and we'll talk about some caching algorithms, um, can dramatically affect you. There are a lot of third-party products on the market that will accurately tell you how many IOPS you're doing. So generally with Windows, it's not an issue to determine how many IOPS you're doing. But as you will learn later, determining how effective and fast those IOPS are on the wire can be somewhat of a challenge. But to know how many you're doing, uh, you can purchase some third-party tools or you can use good old Perfmon, and we'll talk about some of the counters that you can use to get your IOPS.
what I would recommend is doing some, um, taking your physical environment and running some perf mons before to get a baseline. So this is, yeah, so the slide here is saying, cal kind of what I'm saying, calculate your own IOPS, don't go on the white paper. This says 80% write, 20% read, but who, who knows in your environment? Now, are there any questions about this so far? Because now we're going to move to the sand part. So before, we've, we've always had IOP problems. We've always had storage problems. Um, depending on, anybody remember the old 486s? And they came with 8 megs of RAM, and you put Windows 3.1 on there, or they come with 4 megs of RAM, and the hard drive just went crazy, and, and apps would freeze. Well, what you were doing, you were just queuing there. You were doing IOPS. You were queuing. Um, we're just doing the same thing. It's just now we're doing it in the data center, and we're struggling with the same um, type issues. Well, generally today when you do VDI, you place a lot of your workload, because obviously when you need to do a lot of IOPS, and you start getting into 150, 200 disks, 300 disks, some enterprises, thousands of disks. Well, how do you manage all those disks? And you can imagine just, you know, how do you manage all those disks? So we said is let's put those on a network and let's put them on SAN. So SAN basically allows us to increase our storage capacity and performance using disk arrays. And what we can do with the SAN is we can put caching and other algorithms around the SAN to basically improve the performance. It basically helps you with the management of your disk and can help you level, level the playing field. So if you have a huge transaction app, SAN is obviously a great thing. We, for most of you that have large companies or smaller companies, you generally have some sort of SAN in your environment. So I typically ask this question, which is faster, read operations or write operations? Read. You think read, but I tend to disagree with you. But it depends, again, depend on the SAN. Um, I give you a little bit of a hint earlier. I told you that most write operations write to cache. So a read operation, imagine if you're doing a select statement or you're pulling some kind of patient up, you're doing multiple reads, random reads, and yes, if they're not in cache, you have to go to the disk and that's to find them and process that information. But generally with a write, you're, you're processing that write IOP in RAM, and if your SAN is properly done, your write IOPS can be lower. So it's important, that's why I'm telling you, that your RAM cache and when you buy your SAN, when I do consultations with a lot of customers, the, the common thing people want to start talking about is the SAN and the storage and the disk. And the first thing I start talking about is the cache. What kind of cache are you buying? How are you allocating these disks and putting front-end cache around it? Keep in mind that cache is so important even with SSD because SSD typically will improve your read latency but not the writes. And what you really want to do with SSD, since um, certain memory types, writes are very expensive based on the life of the box, is you want to reallocate those blocks so that you're writing them more sequentially. And that's what a lot of your um, vendors do like Quiptail. They have algorithms that cache this information and write these blocks out accordingly. So the caching algorithms that you choose are very important. Left off an S. An IOP is an IOP is an IOP. It's important to remember. We don't care when we do an IOP, whether we're on SATA, SAS, SAN, SSD, RAM, we don't care. An IOP is an IOP. Um, what our goal is, the goal with any IOPs, we just want to get it completed. We want to get it done. It's like a task your boss gives you on your desk. Get it done, move on to the next one. And that's what our goal is. As part of that though, it's important with your goal to make sure that you have a consistent IOP transaction time. Because if you do not have a consistent IOP transaction time, what happens? You have to queue. And when you queue, you start waiting in a line. And none of us like to wait in a line. So if we can reduce the IOP time as much as possible, we can process more I.O., we can produce a consistent time, and what that's going to result to, keeping the end user happy. What we don't want is to get the calls that the user's hung, or the user's freezing, or they're frozen, and basically, typically what you'll call this in is meeting your SLA. Typically, most of your SAN vendors can give you, or most of your SAN admins should be able to give you the amount of time that your IOPS are completing. So you can, this is one of the things you can ask them. You know, we did 26,000 IOPS, what was the IOP transaction time? Now, 
what's a good transaction time? Well, it depends on the number of transactions you have. Obviously, the more transactions you have, the faster that you're going to have to complete these transactions. But generally, depending on the platform, um, an eight millisecond access time or under is, 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 is pretty good. Um, what you want to you know, try to achieve, obviously, is zero millisecond. Um, one is super good. So it's all a big game show. So when you are firing up all these VDIs, this, I want you to go back, and I put this on here to be funny, but I want you to take this back to you, is it's all a big game show. You're playing a game, and you're trying to figure out what storage platform or what technology can you do to accommodate all of these IOPS in your environment. So when, you bring, when, you're, when you're doing VDI, basically, you're bringing these desktop workloads in, and you're just stacking up just tons of IOPS. And now we've got to figure out how can we complete these IOPS, get them off our plate, so we can keep running. And there's two methods to doing this. One is we want to reduce that traffic as much as possible, because we want to do as few IOPS as we can, because that means we get more desktops, we save money, and it makes the whole company or your enterprise or whatever happier. But it's a big game show. And I want to tell you the players. Well, we got old brown round, which is our typical spinning disk we talked about, and there's a couple of those out there. Let me tell you about this guy. He's very stable, he's a proven technology, and he's been around for a long time. He can run hot, he's mechanical, he's a workhorse, but, he's, but he does the job. And then you have RAM, which we all know is extremely fast, comes in various speeds, um, comes in various prices, whether you want RAM redundancy, and then you have SSD, which we have multiple types of SSD, and multiple speeds of SSD. It's important that each one of these players, when you look at them individually, you can buy them, and they, they, they are completely performed differently. So a hard drive is not just a hard drive. Just like, for me, I probably, to play baseball, I don't know if I could hit a ball. Now you take me on the ski slopes, and I'll do a double black all day long but you put me on a baseball field, I, I may strike out. Some of you may get up to the baseball field and hit home runs. We're still people, but we're different. These hard drives, depending on the brand, manufacturer, and so forth, can perform differently. And when you're trying to get things done typically as fast as possible, and you can do it in an economical way, what do you want to do? You want the best player on the team. So you want to get the best drives that you can. There are generally three methods when you're looking at SANs and VDI that you can do to do these IOPS. One is the SAN method, which we talked about before, which is let's take a group of disks, let's connect these disks over iSCSI or fiber or some sort of cabling mechanism so that we can manage them, or let's just attach them directly to where we're at, or let's take a bunch of RAM. What if you could take a bunch of RAM and put it all together, and that's called a RAM SAN. Generally, when you're doing these I.O., as you can imagine, regardless of how fast you are, and let's kind of take fiber out of it, but do you want to run a long distance and come back and then get another IOP, or do you want to go a short distance? So one of your evolutions you're starting to see now with the Fusion I.O. cards and EMC's VF cache, which we'll talk about, is the goal is, is let's get the IOP, the people that are actually able to do the IOP, Let's get the IOP producers as close to VDI as possible. So you're starting to see cards and so forth that can go into VDI that can offload a lot of these things, and that's basically direct attached. It is not an easy game, and this is where, we're, you know, a lot of us are talking about the consumerization of IT, but now our jobs now, as we're focused more on infrastructure, are starting to mirror. We taught this whole presentation right now about storage and IOPS. Many of you may be administering Windows. How many people are administering Windows or some sort of infrastructure in here? So IOPS may be a new game to you. Um, what you will find, but, but you need to get in this business because now you're dependent on someone else to make your platform successful. And if you're, if you're getting caught in user calls, Yes, you're on the line, but you have other people that are also being affected. So it's important for you to troubleshoot your environment, you understand the game that you're playing. So we typically use the statement that 10% of the capacity is driving 90% of the I.O. And what I mean by that 
And what I mean by that is we're doing all of this I.O. and we're generally only using about 10% of capacity. Now what I don't mean by that is literally 10% of the capacity, but based on a percentage of capacity of typical environments. So when you're looking at this, it is very important for you to look at cash in two types of methods. And we're going to, I want to show you some of these methods. You're going to purchase, or your SAN team is going to purchase fronting cash, and then you're going to have backing cash. So fronting cash is typically in memory, and that means that an IOP comes in. If we're doing a write, like we said, it goes to RAM, and then the SAN writes that off and passes that on. Reads come in, they see if it's in cache, if it's not, it has to go to disk. So generally that stuff's stored in RAM. Well, generally there are limitations based on cores and so forth of how much RAM you can put in a SAN. Now I know RAM's cheaper. Typically SANs have about 64 gigabytes of RAM. Some of them are coming more as memory's going down. But the trend now is to say, we would afford all SSD. We would love all SSD. We would love all memory. Um, we would all probably like an M5, um, but we may not be able to fund ourselves. We may have family, kids, house, and so forth. So what we said is, is let's, let's see if we can get best of both worlds. Let's see if we can get the BMW maybe with a sport package versus the M5. So what we can do is we can throw, maybe typically purchase some brown round and use high-speed SSD for caching or use high SSD for caching. And I'll show you a couple of those algorithms uh, coming up in another slide. You'll see some industry trends out there. You've probably seen a lot of these companies. Um, I'm just putting them up there. There are probably some more. Uh, Fusion IO, everybody's read about that. Um, EMC VS Cache and Whiptail. And all of these basically, um, Fusion and VF Cache are competitors. Um, basically, this is SSD on a PCI card um, that gets it as close as you can to the stuff. Um, they're, they're, these guys are kind of in an argument. Fusion says, um, they're extremely fast. EMC says they're fast. Fusion, though, has an offset that it does a lot of its processing on your CPU. So you're losing CPU performance. You're typically um, 10 to 20 percent of CPU to do Fusion I.O., where EMC says let's offload that to a controller. We can get that CPU utilization down to 5 percent. Um, Whiptail is using caching and other algorithms to block their SSD so they get better write performance, but they're all about um, basically getting your I.O. done as, as quickly as possible. It's interesting because Whiptail is a new player to this field. I would not classify them as an enterprise SAN management, but then again, if it solves your use case or if something like it solves your use case, why do you care? Because the argument I've heard for some of these solutions is, well, what happens if we lose the data center? You don't care, there's no data on, the, these, you're, most of these IOPs you're doing are IOPs that you don't care about. You're only doing it for cash. So if it can solve your speed problem and meet your SLAs, you don't care. You want to put your user data, that's where you want to spend the money on, redirecting your user data to um, a SAN. Now EMC, how many people use EMC in here? They've got their fast solution. It's called fully automated steer storage. Now this, what I'm not talking about now is fronting cash, which means the IOP comes into the SAN. Now we're talking about back in cash. And what they'll typically do in this picture here is they'll offload cash, they'll offload IOPS onto this fast cash, write that stuff, and then move it to SATA or fiber channel based on how it's used. Their other method of doing it is let's, let's monitor the IOP patterns and let's do it real time. So as data is more frequently accessed, maybe we have data, a bunch of um, records that are constantly in access, we'll put those in flash and maybe we've got some other data that we don't use and it monitors that, it'll move it down to SATA. Imagine a file server you have, and imagine you've got 10 files that are people use every day, and you probably have a million they don't use. So what it, what it does, it automatically tears that stuff on the back end. NetApp is another major storage vendor. NetApp's core mission, most people don't know, part of that company was started. NetApp believes is let's reduce the cost to the end user by reducing the number of disks. So NetApp, which the power, what's the most powerful thing of any SAN that you're purchasing? Is it the disk? Is it the hardware? Software. It's the software that makes all these things work. Excellent job. So 
NetApp uses what they call flash cache. So as IOPS come in, similar type concept, they write to flash cache and then they write back to disk. Um, and they claim that flash cache can reduce latency by 10 or more. But we know, all know that we don't believe the vendor, we test ourselves. And all of the vendors, whether it's EMC, whether it's Fusion IO, whether it's Data Core, um, all of these companies are centered around optimizing IO. Where all, all these vendors are basically doing the same thing. They're using various technologies to get IOs done as fast as possible. It's just what algorithms are you going to use? It's, think about it this way. There's zip to compress, there's RAR to compress, there's LHA, there's how many compression algorithms are there out there? How many encryption algorithms are there out there? There are various algorithms to get the job done and all of these players have their own algorithms. So it's important again that you test. So again, I wanted to add this different strokes. What are you talking about Willis? Different thing, what, what IOP patterns for your company may not meet May not, you may not be struggling with the same issues that your friend is struggling with. So it's important that yes, you can talk to your peers about what they're using, but it's important, and I'll, we'll talk about this when we get to Edge Site. How many people in here use Edge Site? I, I'm gonna be interested to see your faces after we complete this presentation when we talk about Edge Site. Um, yeah, but we, we wanna talk about that, and we'll talk about how somebody else may not be using Edge Site that one, one of these technologies may work perfect for, where another one that's using that side, it may not. Now, are there any questions? So now we're gonna shift into how do you measure these IOPS before we talk about reducing them. So I hate, I give you some bad news today. Windows does a really poor job at measuring IOPS. I told you before that Windows can tell us the IOPS we're doing, the counts we're doing, and so forth, but Windows has a, does an awful job of telling you how long an IOPS takes to do. Now it's gotten better with XPerf, it's gotten better with certain things, um, but we'll talk about the ways to measure these things. I wish Microsoft would release an IL stat command like we have in Linux, but they do not have it. To, not, to find out the number of IOPS you're doing, you can use these performance counters here. And you can go in, you can say, I want to only look at my C drive IOPS, my D drive IOPS, and so forth. You can also do store port tracing, but the best way to measure IOPS is back end, not front end, with sand tools and HBAs, which we'll talk about. Nobody likes standing in line. We hate it. So it's important. So if if we didn't, if IOPS could just queue up and they cause no user issue, we wouldn't all probably be in this room. But the problem is these IOPS queue up. So generally, if your IOP transaction time is solid and you're not queuing, guess what? We don't care. That means your environment is performing and it's performing effectively. What we care about is when things start queuing. And there are some important counters that I think you should be monitoring, whether on a constant basis or a random basis, and you should be getting alerted on. And this is current disk queue length and average disk queue length. Current meaning what are we, what is our queue depth right now? And average meaning, what is our queue depth since the last point that we collected? So these are two, um, average is a calculated value, where current is an actual real-time value. Both are very important. Depending on the number of spindles that you have behind your platform, if you have a queue depth of three or more, typically, you will start seeing issues. Now, when you have a SAN and you present a line and you say, well, Michael, there's a thousand queues, I'm queuing for three, but I'm still hanging. Well, yes, in most cases, to you, it's a single line, even though behind you is more, you wanna use that three number. Now, if you had a RAID storage adapter and you had three drives in Windows, what you wanna look at when you're calculating this is the number of drives that show up in Windows. So, you wanna look at your queue length and queue depths. When you're troubleshooting performance issues, you always, people want, this is, people want to start at the client, they want to start at Windows, and they want to do all this modern. You're, you are in the wrong place at the wrong time. You always start at the bottom of the stack and go up. And I'm going to tell you why. 
So what you want to do, if you're having, um, if your IOPS are taking too long to complete, we want to go to the sand guys. How, I sent you an IO, how long did it take to complete? And they say, I could complete it in a millisecond, but I saw it took me 60 seconds to do an IOP, which is an enormous amount of time. So now I gotta figure out wh what layer. So your typical layers, depending on, you know, if you had a PCI card with VF cache or Fusion IO, your stack's gonna look different, but you still have a stack. So you have your SAN, your HBA, then you have your controller, and then you have your switch, and then you have an operating system. So you wanna troubleshoot from the bottom up. The only really way to determine um, true IOP times in Windows is to use Windows Store Port Tracing. And it's built into 2008 R2. You can download it for Windows 2008 from this article here. You'll then need to install the Windows SDK. Unless you're a C++ developer or other developer, you probably don't need the whole SDK. You just want to include the Windows Performance Toolkit that you will need as well. Then you'll run an XPerf using these commands. This does require stack walk, which will require disabling page executive. And this will create an ETL trace, but you'll need to be careful analyzing the results. I will show you an ETL trace. And while that's coming up, Anybody know how to go back? Let's see, view. Sorry, guys. Where? Yeah, 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 right there. Ah, oh, sorry guys. Your other ways to measure IOPS are with IO meter and SQL IO. And when you use these, when you do IO meter, you'll typically run with a file-based or raw-based. What I mean by raw is you take a line, it's not formatted, and you do out testing on it. Or you can do it with file-based where you create the file. You can also use SQL IO. How many are doing this to tell if your SAN is properly working properly? Good and bad idea. The problem is, is every time you do an IO, if it's file-based, is you're going through the operating system's drivers, the operating system stack to do that I.O. So imagine if you had installed an antivirus product on the box and you installed a large file and you're doing a lot of I.O., you're going through that driver. You may go through one or more drivers to do that I.O. So this is measuring perceived performance, not actual performance. And this is where I still want Microsoft to show us what is the, from after all that, from the kernel down, what is the IOP time? There are many factors that will affect your performance when you're measuring perceived performance. Your filter drivers, your SAN cache, the system cache in Windows because Windows is caching, whether you're running deduplication on the back end, there's tons of things that can affect these numbers. So it's in careful when you use these things that you're really careful. So let's look at XPerf. What's cool about the XPerf trace is you can go in to a process, here's Windows Write for instance, and you can go in, and this is disk utilization, and you can see um, the service times, the read counts and so forth for that process. You can also go back 
Let's look at WordPad. Now you can see every IOP that was done, even down to the DLLs, and you can look at your service times, recounts, and so forth for what's happening. This is extremely helpful information if you really want to look at what, what your IOPS are doing and how fast they are. And this is an XPerf trace. So basically what happens is you take the XPerf, you go into the, it'll create an ETL file and you load it up in the viewer and for time's sake I'm just showing you the results of the data here. But we have to keep in mind that this data is what? Showing you the IOP time going down through all the filters and so forth. So things like software that you install in the box and so forth will also affect um, you as well. And I'm a good person, I remember. So remember, it's important for you to know each layer of the stack to know who your bottleneck is. Be careful, as I said, with XPerf and the other tools because depending on your um, block size that your volume's formatted in, this may skew your results. So it's important to be really careful. And again, I'm going to leave you with always, always start at the bottom of the stack and work your way to the top. Procmon. If you're really wanting, now we're going to dive into reducing. How do we reduce and measure? How many people use Procmon on a daily basis? How many people it's your go-to tool? Well, I'm doing a whole session, um, a lightning session, um, next the next time we're coming up on how GPOs work, and I'm also doing one on sys internals and why those tools are really important. So hopefully you'll get some good information there. But it turns out that I've always had this rule to um, anybody that works with me, and if you ask them, they'll probably tell you, but one of my, I have these commandments, and one of them is like you don't hard code IPs and things, but rule number one is when you're troubleshooting is I shall prop mine. Because prop mine gives you a really good insight to what's happening. It'll also show you helpfully um, discover poorly written applications. Um, so it's the tool to use. Well, it's interesting. What you want to do with Procmon, generally, is on your image, fire it up sometime. If you're doing your VDI image, fire it up and just capture for a couple minutes and then just see what all is going on. You may be just surprised at the level of I.O. that's going on. Now, if you see like a million events, all those events don't correspond to a disk I.O. But there is a way that we can tell who our players were during that time, and I'm going to show you. Did you know that you can ask Perfmon to show you the I.O. that you did while you were running the session? And I'm going to show you how to do that. And you might be surprised what you uncover. That was the ETL trace. Now, ETLs take a lot of space. Procmon takes some overhead, but not a lot. So I'm now capturing some data here. I'm just going to go in and I'm going to fire it right. And I'm going to now in capture. And you can sort up here by registry. Generally, if you're looking for IOPS, the registry, Typically in memory, I kind of exclude those. But this will show me a lot of the information that's in Procmon. And we'll talk a little more about this in the next session about what some of these things do. But the one I really like for the IOP one, file summary. And this will show you the total number of events, how many opens, how many closes you do, and how many reads, how many writes. And the important column I typically look at is read and write bytes because that gives me a good indicator of I.O. going on. How much am I reading? How much am I writing? You may be surprised at what you find as what I was surprised at what I found. So we talked about edge site. And I hate to say this about edge site, but it needs to be said because they need to correct it. And they need to correct the problem. So I've been to several sessions this time. Three minutes. 30. I've been to several um, sessions um, here, um, and they've all talked about using Edge Site, and I have to say that my skin kind of got a little, little, my hair kind of went up. And it's not that I don't love the tool. I think the tool is an amazing tool. So let me start with this. I think it's an awesome tool for troubleshooting. The problem is it has some problems. 
So what happened is, is if you install edge type and you have a large number of VDIs, or you have a large number of um, sister servers that you're monitoring, you may be surprised to learn that based on your user load, edge site becomes your top IO consumer. And when I mean top IO consumer, I mean top in the whole company. Like it might top your ERM system. <coughs> so what you want to do is you want to look at your back end and IO stat numbers and run perf, perfmon and you will see. I have seen edge site, personally myself, in a short trace, and I mean short, I don't have the exact number here, but 30, 40, maybe a minute, gener do 100 meg, 170 megs of I.O. And, and you will see this, so you can go back. But again, it depends on the number of users you have on that given host and the number of hosts that it's going to affect. If you just have one host, 100 meg of I.O., it's not really an issue. But I've seen these hosts go up, to creep up to as much as a, um, 70 plus IOPS per second that Edge Site's doing. Well, there's no surprise um, that it's doing all this. Basically, they write all their event data to, um, to Firebird. It's a Firebird database, and there's no real issue with that. When I've used that platform, I, I don't know. But the problem that I have with it, and they need to do, is they didn't have the foresight to only let you monitor what you want to monitor. You can't just go in there and say, I only want disk numbers, or I only want ICA round trip time. They just collect all of this information and they stuff it in this database. Now, they do, you can go in there and it's misleading as you can tweak and say, I only want to, and it's kind of misleading, it's like I only want to capture this, but what that means is I'm only going to send this to the master SQL database, but the client is still capturing all this information. So it's writing it into, um, it's writing it in, in there. And I'll give you a couple tricks on what I think what my, what your possible solution might be to this issue if you truly need to use Edge Site. I put this on here for two reasons. One is this is a really good real world example of something that you may could do without, I would hate to say, because you may not be able to afford the amount of IOPS that it would take, I mean I'm talking massive investment that it would take to do some of the things that you need to do. And Citrix says they're working on it, but I want to educate you as the customer because the more Citrix customers that complain about this issue, the quicker we'll be able to get a resolution from them. Yep. So I'm going to give you a couple, couple of things that I think you can do um, what I'm doing. Um, paging, so one of the things that you really want to be careful of is paging. And if you make your machines, your VDI machines, too small, then you're going to do more paging on disk, right? And that is what? More IOPS. So a couple schools of thought on this. It's always a battle between page file size and your available memory. So um, you want to make sure that you have enough RAM to be able to, to handle so that you're not generating just an, an abundance of IOPS. The other thing that you can do to improve your performance and reduce your IOPS, um, and again this is talking about for those of us that are non-SSD, and what I mean by non-SSD it means you have any of your storage as part of the stack that's on, um, that's, that's part of this, is you could use disk fragmentation that can help you um, your split IOP. And a split IOP means I'm doing this IOP, but I need to go get some other data because it's not contiguous on the disk. So I'm just going to, Windows is going to split that IOP. And there's actually a perfmon counter that you can look called split IOPs. You can't guarantee that split IOP is because of defragmentation, but it's a general okay um, indicator. My favorite tool is Disk Keeper. Um, you can also do boot time um, D defragmentation. Well, the problem with boot time defragmentation in VDI, so basically what, what the theory of boot time defragmentation is, is we have this image, so let's, window, what Windows can do is it can sequence the files so that it optimizes that IOO when the machine boots, so you boot faster. It's called part of their fast boot, um, ready boost and stuff technology. But the problem is, is that in order to do that, the prefetcher in Windows must be on. But you don't want to leave the prefetcher on in VDI because then the 
part of the prefetcher is it optimizes blocks real time. So as you launch an application, it learns your application launch habits and then it sequences the stuff so it launches faster. But that also generates more IOPS, a ton of IOPS. So for VDI, it's a best practice to turn that off. So it's like a catch-22, like how do, you, how do you boot time defrag and how do you, with the prefetcher turned on? So what you can do is you can download this utility that I've written called BDUtil, and it's free. And you can run BDUtil, and BDUtil will defragment your boot time volume, and it'll take 15 minutes or so. All BDUtil's doing is saving you the complexity of turning on the prefetcher, going through and doing everything. But this does, this, there's a problem because in the previous slide we talked about SAN um, hot space, and we talked about moving things that are hot into SSD. So you have to be careful if you're doing a lot of defragmentation on the SAN that it may start moving some of your blocks into your and start overloading your cache and it may start filling up your cache. So your SAN guys may not be too happy about that. So you wanna be very careful when you start looking at um, these defrag techniques. You run this in the base image before you seal it up. And when, and when BD Util is done, it'll actually shut the prefetcher back off as well. So Citrix provisioning server, PVS, um, one of the cool things that Citrix claims it offloads um, from the SAN. So the theory is, is I need to start up 500 desktops or 500 terminal servers or 500 servers, and instead of me having to do all those IOPS on the SAN, I'm gonna do those on the provisioning server. And it does do that. So it does do what it says. The problem is, is most of us cache, we store our cache on, in the setting, it's store on cache on client hard drive. So with PVS, you can stay so basically what happens is, does everybody know PVS or? So PVS is an operating system streaming technology. So you have app streaming, this streams the whole operating system. So just like with app streaming, you cache blocks, it caches the files as well. Um, so when you boot up and it talks to NNT kernel and it goes through each file or you start write, WordPad, WinWord, whatever, it'll actually cache that. It can cache that in memory or it can cache that um, on the PVS server, there's different places you can store the cache. But for most people, we cache on the client hard drive. So we have to be careful because all we're really doing is moving those IOPS. We're still, yes, we're saving them on the back end and it's helping us with boot storms, but we're still writing those files down on the, each individual VDI client. So you're still generating IOPS. Um, now Citrix has um, MCS compared to PVS is about 1.5 IOPS increase. But again, that's comparing cache and RAM, not cache on client hard drive. So when you design your PVS server, it's important to properly set your system cache um, to make sure that you're using as much of your memory cache as possible because all PVS is is basically just loading up data from a VHD file and caching it in memory. So a lot of people have asked about when you create a, a VHD, and PVS, you have the option as you do any VHD of creating it as a fixed size or creating it as a dynamic size. And there's been a lot of debate about whether you should still create your VHDs as fixed or dynamic. If you create them as fixed and you make the base image 60 gigs, it's gonna take 60 gigs of space on the SAN. If you create it as dynamic, it's only gonna use the space that's required for what you're doing. Well, the old recommendation was to use Fixed. My recommendation generally, if you're using PVS, now this is the caveat of PVS, since PVS is caching all this information in memory anyway, so you could imagine over time, most of us have large PVS servers, now memory's pretty cheap, so you're caching all this information. So having a dynamic disk, even if you take a small performance penalty, saves you so much money on the back end. And once you do that IOP, unless you're just having tons of them and you're clearing out your cache, it's already in memory anyway. So if you're booting 50 boxes at one time and it gets that file, it's only getting that file one time and then sending it down to the clients because the next client that needs it, it's in memory. So dynamic is typically um, the way you go. However, I do still recommend defragging, making sure that you keep your NTFS volumes for PVS defragmented. 
um, unless those volumes are on, on SSD. I don't see any need, really, performance increase you would get from PBS from SSD because PBS is stored most of the image in memory anyway. The other thing that you want to do when you're looking at um, reducing IOPS in your, in your VDI environment is you want to follow your vendor's best practices. So VMware has one for Windows 7. Citrix has a couple um, for, um, for VDI. And these will give you tons of tips. They're more than we could talk about in here. There's probably hundreds of tweaks you want to do to VDI um, to reduce the number of IOPS. But it's important that you go through these guides. Even if you're a Citrix shop, go through the VMware one. If you're VMware, go through Citrix. Because at the end of the day, it's Windows, and yes, there may be some vendor-related things in there that it might talk about, but you may be surprised that you can get some information from one and correlate them together. An important one um, that I always put up here is to make sure you disable the last access time. Um, by default, Windows will store the last time you access a file, so you just want to make sure that, uh, so basically every time it does anything to a file, it's updating this bit, this last access time bit, so um, there's a registry key for that, and those are in the best practices. Um, use folder redirection whenever you can, but just keep in mind that when you are using folder redirection, again, you're shifting the IOP to another problem, but it does kind of um, help you segment that traffic from the VDI environment. The problem is, is when you redirect this traffic, your file servers now are doing more work. So now you're putting more work on a file server or a NAS device, and you want to make sure that you properly scale your file server so that you don't cause client-side queuing and server-side queuing. So the issue you'll run into with this, if you don't properly scale your file server, either for number of CPUs, number of memory, and so forth, and you're using redirected folders, an IOP will come in, it's going to send that IOP over to the file server. You know, it's going to send, send a query over to the file server. The server's going to process it and say, oh, well, you need some data. It's going to do an IOP. And if that IOP, if the server's not able to respond back to the client, the client's going to queue and wait, and you're going to start getting app hangs. And you're going to get an app hang on your server side. And then you're going to start getting calls saying the logins are slow and things are, are freezing, or is freezing and so forth. So again, you want to make sure you look at the discounters and server worker threads if you're using Windows. Um, on your file server. So server worker threads are the number of threads and an indication of how well your, how healthy your Windows file server is from a worker standpoint, not from an IO standpoint, from a worker standpoint. And when you run a worker threads, the server can't process any more information. So these are very good counters for you to look at as well. Another big one, um, is to configure and select your antivirus. And again, these are my own opinions um, based on my testing, but again, this will vary for you. But antivirus is um, one of the biggest challenges that you will face when you're getting your VDI uh, on how to properly configure this. This is for several reasons. One is the speed of the engine varies greatly. So McAfee's engine and Semantics engine, not even how accurate the viruses are, there, there's a lot of things that go into selecting an antivirus product. But the speed of how, how much it can take, so basically for given an I.O. or given a file, how quickly can I process that file and get back to you that that file is clean? And there are various algorithms for doing that, and base them are different speeds. Um, again, my official recommendation for VDI is Intel McAfee. Um, and this is based on, yes, um, there are two, there's McAfee Move and the McAfee Client, so you can do either. So you can offload the virus scanning to another client, or you can do it directly on there. And I'll show you in the client, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, the worst that I've tested has been the slowest performance of the engine. Now they have some offloading concepts as well, has been Trim Micro. But again, you need to, to test this. Um, two things you want to look at is offload caching and scan cache. Now, what you can do with scan cache is kind of cool. So with McAfee, what you can do is you can say, once I've scanned a file with the latest 8.8, .8, and this is what I wanted for years, 
is you can say, unless the file's changed, and you, I've already scanned it, I'm not going to scan it again until the virus definitions change. So that is a caveat. And I can also save this across reboots. So this is kind of cool because how many of you, and one of the things I do like about McAfee, it'll actually tell you real time if you look in the console how many files it's actually scanned. So I love the fact that I can actually like boot up a box, do some work, and then come back and see it's scanned, 20, it's done 20,000 scans, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, I've got to turn some things off because this is obviously a lot. Um, so let's say you fire up Internet Explorer. Well, with most antivirus, if you're, because the viruses have gotten smarter, so we're having to turn more rules on and exclude less. So what's happened is you fire up WinWord, it scans WinWord, you close WinWord, you fire it up again, it scans it again. It's, a, it's just all these viruses are scanning constantly. So what McAfee did is, now Trend has done this, but Trend has done it, and I don't know if they've changed it, but the last time when we did this, that you had to run this tool and it had to go through every file on the disk and it marked it as clean. Where McAfee does this real time inline, and they say, this file's been scanned, it was cleaned as of the last definitions, and unless the definitions change, um, I'm not going to do that. Now, you can also, one of the issues that you run into when you're doing this um, is, especially if you're doing full scans, is um, if you go out and you say, let's scan everything, I'm going to force a full scan. What if you're scanning everybody all at once and everybody's doing a full scan, you're doing tons of IOPS, you're killing the sand, the cache is going through the roof, the hypervisor CPU is up. So a lot of the vendors now have hypervisor plugins, McAfee Move, and some of the other things that will offload some of this work onto a server, and it can communicate and kind of say, okay, I'm going to scan you guys, and okay, you go, and, and those type things. So you'll need to do your testing. Um, I've kind of been to keep it simple. So typically, for most of the stuff I've done, they're PVS environments. So they're, most of the images are, are read-only anyway. So if I got a virus, I would just patch and keep going, and then I'll have a backup plan. So I just inject the McAfee client in and turn on caching and do some exclusions, which I'll show you in the previous slide, and that's typically worked. And for my PVS environments, I typically don't run full scans. So um, when you, if you do install antivirus, make sure you exclude common areas like the principal or the, you don't want the page file to be scanned. Um, you'd be amazed that some of these virus products, even like McAfee, they'll just scan the page file, so you want to be careful. Um, one that you used to do is scan on reads, but man, you're really, you know, it depends on your environment. If you're using PVS and images read only, scan on writes may be what you want to, what you want to look at. Place your antivirus definition on a persistent drive so that you're not constantly pulling them down. A couple of tweaks here as well. Other tips that you may not be aware of is look at your auto run and your Windows services to turn off and delete items that are not used. So those documents that I gave you have a bunch of service tweaks that you can turn on and turn off. So you can disable and delete items um, that you may not use. And don't forget that almost all these products now, when you install them like Java and Flash, which hopefully Flash is on Sunset, um, they all want to do auto updates, so you want to make sure that in your VDI image that you're turning off all of these automatic updates so they're not constantly checking. Otherwise, every time you launch something or periodically it's going out and checking and then you've got five or 600 VDI boxes that are checking, um, which you may not need to. Um, turn off crash dump is another tweak um, that you may want to do. Um, properly size your JRE cache, so Sun Java does a bunch of caching. And what it'll do is it'll store all these files. If you watch it, as you go to all these Java sites, it'll store all these files. And then it creates like an index of where all these cache files are at. So sometimes as your cache gets larger, you just do tons of IOPS while it's trying to figure out and re-index all this information. So properly sizing your JRE cache or turning it off is probably the best um, thing to do. But again, it depends on your app, because if you have a large app that's sending large jar file downs, you may want those to be in cache or pre-cache them. But I do want to mention it here that JRE cache is something you definitely want to look at. Always in your image, um, disable volume snapshots, disable the prefetcher, turn off automatic defrag, disable system restore, turn off registry points, and turn off, there are a lot of items in task scheduler that you may not be aware of. When you go into Windows and the task scheduler, 
there are tons of tasks that Microsoft ships out of the box that just do certain things, um, like reg idle backup, SQM upload, um, hot start. So a lot of these things in a VDI environment may not apply. And I haven't seen some of these things in a, in a best practices guide um, from some of these guys. So this is one that I've kind of added. So what I, wanted, what I would recommend is going through Task Manager on a base clean install of Windows and lean out certain things that you see that you may not need. And these are some things you can actually turn off pretty safely. And all these things are running. These are tasks that run. Some of these things run every time the user logs in. Some of these things run every 15 minutes. And these are just IOPS you're doing. They're not turned off when you install the Not to my not know. A lot of these tweaks you would need to perform. The other thing you can do is you can offload your, the problem. So if you have a big IOP hog app, you can move it to Zen app terminal server, but the problem when you're doing there is, unless it's a physical server, Zen app server, which most people have gone virtual, um, you're just moving the problem um, somewhere else. So with the problem with Edge Site, you can also use RAM to solve some of these problems. So as, as memory is going down in price and we're able to get more memory on a blade. I mean now processors, I mean we're getting you know 24, 36 way processors on a blade. We're getting you know 300 gigs of memory on a box. You now have more RAM that you could carve out in the guest operating system to do certain things. So it's kind of a battle between do I do these, do I do all these optimizations on the back end or do them on the front end? And this is just another thing to think about. I'm not saying it would apply for your environment, but for example, for Edge Site, I mean, the Edge Site database generally is what, 200 megs. So imagine if you had a blade and um, you carved 200 megs out for every client, um, and you created a RAM drive, and then you redirected the Edge Site database on the RAM drive. So typically, with things like the IMA database and um, Edge Site databases, if, if you have enough memory capacity on your boxes, you can use a good old RAM drive, redirect those, those access databases and so forth to, um, to another, another area and solve your, solve your issues that way. And the company that I use for RAM caching is um, Superspeed. And then here's some links that I'll put there during the presentation just for other links for best practices for um, finding a better way to measure IOPS and so forth. So as you can see, this is a pretty complex picture here that you need to paint based on learning about what SAN investment you need to do to measuring these IOPS to reducing these IOPS. But at the end of the day, what to take from this is when you are building these desktops, you want to make sure that you're optimizing them as much as possible to reduce the IOPS because the investment that you're going to have to make in storage and so forth is going to be a lot. So Hopefully I've helped you today and you can take back a lot of this stuff um, as you do in your VDI implementations or can improve your VDI implementations. Any questions? Thank you.